Uh, Imad, floor is yours. Welcome. All right. Yeah. Uh, so thanks to the organizers for having me here and uh, to the external panelists for taking time out for this and to everyone in the audience for showing up. Right. So this, uh, this is a paper on designing effective music excerpts. Uh, and this paper is motivated by a practical problem uh, that marketers face in short form content platforms. Right. So short, short form content platforms have grown rapidly in the past five years. Uh, Vine started this format back in 2014 with six second clips, but TikTok is now sort of the canonical example uh, and it has a user active user base that's second only to Facebook as of 2022. Uh, so this is a, a naturally excited creators and marketers who see this as sort of a new opportunity to engage with consumers using short clips or excerpts of their long form content. And there's this a survey done by HubSpot just earlier this year, which found that short form was uh, content, short form content was the top priority of marketers who were surveyed uh, in January this year. Uh, in, in the context of music marketing and music creation in particular, TikTok has been a very exciting development. It's become a prominent platform to discover music. Uh, and this has, the success of artists like Lil Nas X has uh, sort of excited musicians about going viral on these platforms and making it big commercially. Right? Uh, but virality on short form content platforms doesn't actually pay the bills. The royalties on TikTok uh, by, by themselves are fairly low compared to long form platforms like Spotify and YouTube Music. So what artists really need to do is they need to somehow get short, convert short form viewers into long form consumers. So they need to build this pipeline that takes people from TikTok and gets them onto Spotify and listening uh, to their music. And it turns out that this is quite challenging. Uh, so there's this nice video by Vox and The Pudding, uh, which uh, talks about how only a minority of artists who go viral on TikTok actually end up making it big commercially. Right? So, and this was the broad motivation for this paper. How can we design excerpts that uh, make people click through from the short form content to the long form uh, consumption on platforms like Spotify? So in today's talk, I'm going to focus on a narrower question. I'm going to focus on one aspect of excerpt design, which is excerpt length. And this is motivated by platforms recently relaxing content length restrictions. So the, it used to be just 15 seconds. Uh, and now it's all the way up to three, I think 10 minutes now on TikTok, if you have the right sort of privileges. Uh, and, and the question is, how does excerpt length impact long form demand? And theoretically, it's unclear. It's unclear whether and how uh, excerpts impact demand. So longer excerpts can provide consum consumers more information to, to figure out whether the song is a good fit. But at the same time, they may also uh, substitute for the long form content so they can also cannibalize demand. So this is, it's sort of similar to free trials of information goods in the sense that uh, you, you have both this eff effect of market expansion and demand cannibalization. Uh, in the context of uh, music in particular, length may not even matter because consumers can just skip excerpts that are excessively long. So there's this, nature, this, this uh, sort of endogenous consumption that uh, because of which length may not even matter. So the goal of this research is to sort of empirically answer this question of how does excerpt length affect long form demand. So the, an, an interesting footnote is that creators and marketers today have not actually adopted long, longer content on short form platforms. Uh, so the, the, I'm, I'm showing you two examples of marketers here who are fairly active on Twitter, who still recommend sticking to shorter content, despite the fact that you can make clips on TikTok up to uh, uh, more than a minute long. Right? So that's sort of the state of uh, pra uh, marketing practice today. Right? So how are we going to answer this question? And the way we're going to answer this question is with a natural experiment on the iTunes music store. So the iTunes store was launched by Apple in 2003 to sell downloads of albums and songs a la carte. And by 2011, it was a dominant force in the digital music scene. So it had a market share of 70%, uh, which in turn comprised 41% of all recorded music revenue. And so it was a pretty big deal in the downloading era of music. And, uh, it's, and it's still available today, but it, of course, was overtaken by uh, streaming platforms like Spotify. And before buying a track on iTunes, consumers can listen to a short preview or an excerpt of the track for free. Right? So this was the nature of how people would discover music. And the excerpt length uh, on iTunes was 30 seconds until November 2010, near the peak of the downloading era, so near the peak of iTunes. 
when Apple announced this controversial policy change. So Apple announced that all tracks that were at least 150 seconds long on iTunes would have 90 second previews from, so there's an increase from 30 second previews and the remaining tracks would continue to have 30 second previews. And the wording of this policy change is interesting. So Apple said if a label did not agree to the change, they had to leave the platform. So there was some sort of little bit of arm twisting from Apple's end. And of course there was some, there was some legal resistance uh, but eventually on December 8, 2010, people started observing 90 second previews for the first time on the iTunes music store. So we're going to use this policy change as a natural experiment to study the impact of longer excerpts on music consumption. Uh, so this, my, so, yeah. Sorry to interrupt. Uh, just one quick question regarding the content of excerpt. So for, uh, for the ones on iTunes, is it just the uh, playing from the beginning and then cut it off after 30 or 90 seconds? Or can the musicians decide what to put into it to highlight uh, the parts of the music? Yeah, technically musicians can decide. Practically, as an artist, you have very little control over how your music is sold. You have to delegate that to your distributor or your label. So that's how it works in practice. And I will show you where the excerpts start in my data. So I'll actually show you what happens. Uh, but yes, you can start the excerpt wherever you want uh, if your label lets you do that. So that's a good question. All right. Um, so this is a natural experiment. Uh, so and we are we are analyzing music consumption in sort of in during the downloading era. So there's some today we don't download music. We pay for this for a monthly subscription and then we stream it on demand. Uh, so things are a bit different now, but it's still there's still a few compelling characteristics about analyzing music consumption in the downloading era. The first thing is paid downloads are a very active choices. You pay a dollar, you download a song, you put on your iPod and you listen to that song. Uh, I'm going to argue that this gives you a stronger signal of preference than passive listening, which is more common on streaming music platforms. So just because you listen to a song on streaming music platforms, I, I'm going to say it probably, I, I, I'm not sure if you're actually listening to it uh, or uh, you're probably just checked out and driving in a car or doing something else. Right? So I think it's a stronger signal of uh, of choice. Uh, and in fact, the Billboard and the RIAA today equate one song download to 150 streams. And this is for sales uh, certification and for, for charting uh, purposes. Right? The second difference between the downloading era and now is that alternative discovery mechanisms were quite primitive. Uh, so things like personalization was very limited on the iTunes store. Uh, there was no direct way of sharing content. There was no social network embedded within iTunes the way TikTok is right now. So in some sense, this makes the extrapolation from then to now a little bit tricky, but it's also a benefit in some way because we, it lets us study the impact of excerpts in isolation, independent of recommender systems and social effects and so on. Right? So these are the two main... Yeah. Imad, that's maybe totally my ignorance with the industry, but, but a, a question around the, the downloading. Um, where do the artists make more of their money from downloading or from stream? Do they make money out of stream? So if I just listening to Spotify yeah. as part of my streaming, how big is they? Because if you're going to look at the impact on your downloading, where the money coming from, and maybe the impact of these 90 seconds is ain't elsewhere. Yeah, yeah. So during this era, this the, the, uh, the time period I'm going to analyze is pre-Spotify in the US. So there was no Spotify. There were other streaming platforms that were not very popular, like Rhapsody and so on. But today, uh, so per stream, you get paid something like one thousandth of a cent. So per stream, you don't get paid uh, much uh, compared to per download back in the downloading era. Right? So, but uh, yeah, but the, the time period I'm analyzing, the, there was actually not, not much streaming. Artists were mainly earning from physical sales and from digital sales. Right? All right, so what do we do? So we use this variation generated by this policy change, which changes the excerpt length and it changes the excerpt audio. And we use this to study two things. We study how does excerpt length affect long form consumption? And we indirectly study information provision as a mechanism by developing two audio based measures, which are related to the information contained in excerpts audio. Right? So we're gonna study the main effect and then we're gonna uh, provide indirect evidence for this mechanism by looking at some property of the of the audio. So I'll give you a, a quick preview of our results. So what we find is 
that longer excerpts increase monthly sales of a song by 5.4% on average. Uh, and you can think of sales as an increase in the number of unique monthly listeners. Because once a person buys a song, they can just listen to it forever. And I'm assuming everyone who buys a song listens to it at least once. Right? So there's an increase in the monthly, uh, unique, unique monthly listen, listeners of a song. Uh, and to give you a sense of uh, how big this magnitude is, uh, th there's a nice paper by Aguiar and Walt Fogel, which finds that being included on the Spotify global top 50 playlist increases streams by around 3%. So this effect is comparable to the effect of being included on uh, uh, a, a, Spot a Spotify editorial playlist. Uh, and when we look at heterogeneity of this effect uh, across artist and song popularities, what we find is that the impact is higher for less popular songs uh, based on their sales in the previous year. And it's particularly high for less popular songs by less popular artists. So this heterogeneity supports information provision as a possible uh, mechanism. The second thing we find when we look at the audio and we measure some properties of the audio that are related to how informative it is, the second thing we find is that the demand enhancing effect of longer previews is suppressed when they're too repetitive, when they're too predictable, and when they're too unpredictable. Right? And I'm gonna explain this in more detail when I actually come to it. I'm just gonna tell you what the result is uh, on this slide. Uh, hi, Imad. Uh, yeah. Just a clarification question. Um, you, you kind of brought up streaming as well as sales, and I think I might have missed this, but these two effects here, 5.4%, is this, is, do you have a conversion between streams and sales or when you're looking at this overall effect or is this only for, although the second one looks like it's streams only, but this looks like. Yes, you're right. You're right. So this is not, it, this is not like an apples to apples uh, comparison. I, I might have, okay. So when you buy a song, you buy it once and you can listen to it a million times, any number of times, right? So it, the number of listens when you buy a song is not something I observe. Right? So if you, if you count the number of listens and try to make it equivalent to the number of streams, I don't know how big that number actually is. Uh, but the number of streams is something you can actually, it's the number of times a song is listened to in total. But yeah, you're right. It's not. Hey, not, not to pick you. So there's a conversion kind of just because you don't observe some. some okay. Thank you. Yeah. yeah, yeah, you're right. It's not, it's, not, it's not apples to apples, but just to give you a sense of what is 5%. Uh, is that something you could get by just putting an ad out on Facebook? So just, just to give you a sense of the magnitude of that. Of that yeah, thank you. Good question. Uh, thank can, you. can I clarify, just given these two things are next to each other, so we should think about this 5% as overall, all songs on the platform now are downloaded more. So in Waldfogel's kind of the Agor Waldfogel paper, it's probably both business stealing and market expansion. Here you would argue it's all market expansion. For treated, yes. Yeah. For treated songs that had their excerpt length increased, yeah. So on on average, uh, uh, the so all uh, these for, on average over all of these songs on iTunes, the sales increased. So the way to think like all songs like iTunes just downloads increased by five percent for all of them. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, I think Got that's it. right. And then I I guess. Uh... Just to to see if there's a right intuition to think about this, because I think in the music context, a lot of value is coming from replay, right? As you mentioned, so because you're gonna listen to it many many times, especially after you buy it. So I guess, so if based on that argument, uh, wouldn't we expect the longer the excerpt, the better? So ideally, you probably want to just show the entire song, and then people who liked it would buy it. Is that the right way to think about it? Uh. Because I don't see, uh, I guess I'm trying to think about the trade-off you mentioned at the beginning for information, yeah. good, right? Because for cannibalization, I don't see that as as being very important for music, given that most of the values come from replay. So, yeah, so it, I guess it depends to what extent you think people are collectors of music versus music explorers. Uh, so there's a paper by uh, by Bart Donenberg uh, and Hannes Datta about people who adopt, how did streaming displace uh, purchases? And what they find is that once people were able to stream, they, they became sort of 
music explorers. They would listen to a single song, many a variety of songs, uh, a, f- a few times. So I, it yeah, it depends on to what extent that repeat consumption is something that yeah is it the strength of repeat consumption i think it depends on that um so i still think there might be a trade off if most people are sort of music explorers if they are satisfied after listening to it to a lot of songs just once uh then maybe showing the full song is going to cause cannibalization right i guess but in this setting is more about purchase right this is the pre streaming era yeah. so i guess for people who want to purchase the song it must be the case that they want to listen to it multiple times. That so that's true. So Not necessarily if, okay. Yes. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So in this case, there is you're right. So there is a, I guess there is a friction, a cannibalization friction. Another reason why people might, even if an excerpt is long, they might still want to download. Is you can't put it. You can't put an excerpt on your iPod, uh, and listen to it on the go. Yeah. So you're right. There are some things that limit cannibalization in this setting. Uh, in practice, yeah, but theoretically, it's still a possibility. Practically, yes, you're right. Yeah, it's probably it's limited. So that's a good point. Okay. So let, let me. All right. So this was uh this was a preview of the results, and now I want to talk a little bit about today. So today we don't have excerpts. Right? So how do you explore music on Spotify today? Typically, what happens is Spotify recommends you a song. Or maybe an editorial playlist recommends you a song. You listen to the first five, ten, fifteen seconds, and then you decide to skip the song if you don't like. It. And so that's a very common mechanism of music discovery today. And what this work suggests is that m- maybe that is inefficient because maybe the start of the song is not the most informative part of the song. So maybe platforms actually need an excerpt-driven discovery mechanism. Which is better than the way things work right now, which is just listen to the first ten seconds of the song, uh, and this sort of rationalizes the launch of these new platforms today. So there's this platform called YouTube Samples that YouTube Samples that came out a couple of months ago, which actually just serves samples of music on YouTube. So it's like we're, we're seeing this sort of resurgence of excerpt-driven discovery, which what my research is saying is that it's, it's might it might be a good thing. All right. So let me stop here for questions from uh, the panelists and the audience, and then I'll start talk. I- I'll get into my the rest of my. Talk. There is no questions in the Q and A now. I think people okay. ask questions so far, so you can continue. All right. Okay. Cool. Okay. Uh, so let me. I'm not going to get into this model. Uh, so this is you. You. There's a lot of theoretical work on free trials. You can distill all of that into a super simple model and try to just come up with some simple predictions. Right? So I'm not going to get into the model, but I'll tell you what it predicts. So the prediction is that if you ignore cannibalization, as you increase information in excerpts, it should increase demand. So that's that's a, that's a simple model prediction, and you can increase information by increasing the length of excerpts, but this might cannibalize demand. So that's the sort of the main trade off which makes the overall effect uh, ambiguous and the second thing that this uh, that a simple model predicts is that the uh, the the rate of increase with information decreases with consumers prior match value for the song right? so if the prior is high for popular songs you'd expect a lower if a lower effect of information on these songs and this all this is not a contribution of this paper this is all uh, coming from prior work so something that a theory that we don't actually test in this paper is uh, this theory that maybe information doesn't matter. Maybe people just listen to uh, uh, the full song based on whether they like the excerpt or not. And maybe they like really like your guitar solo. It tells you nothing about the song, but you still go and listen to the song because you like the guitar solo. So that's not something I'm actually going to be able to test. But I'll hint at this alternative theory in in parts of this uh, talk. Uh, but in general, this work is related to two strands of literature. The first strand is this empirical literature on what is the optimal length of a free trial. So there's some work on this uh, of, uh, from Hema Yoganar Siman and co-authors, and some work on this from uh, Sinan Aral and Parambir uh, Dhilon, who find that shorter trials and fewer free news articles are actually better for consumption. And I'm I'm saying that it's it may not be right to extrapolate from 
software and new subscriptions to hedonic goods like music because they may be harder to value. So maybe it's, it's not such a good idea to have shorter excerpts. The second standard of literature is on excerpt design. So there's some work on designing excerpts for, for books uh, and uh, designing excerpts of trailers. And in this, uh, these papers hold the excerpt length as fixed exogenously. Uh, so we so we are actually complementing this literature by looking at length and what is the impact of length net of cannibalization. Right. So now let me get into my uh, empirical context. So uh, and, and my let me start with my data. So to answer this question, we need two sources of data. The first source is tracks and previews on the iTunes Music Store. And the challenge here is that, that we need both the pre and the post policy previews. Right? And the post policy previews are no longer available to consumers on the iTunes music store. You go to a, so a song longer than 150 seconds now, the preview is gonna be 90 seconds. It turns out that if you get access to this uh, data source called the Apple Enterprise Partner Feed, in this data source, there is a link to every the pre policy preview of every song, the 30 second preview of every song. So you can use these links to get the pre-policy previews. iTunes, uh, the website, uh, the, the, the software itself has the post-policy previews and you can combine them and get all, all the previews of uh, tracks on iTunes. So that was the first uh, sort of data challenge we had to solve. The second data source is, uh, it's a standard data source, which is uh, Luminate. This was formerly known as Nielsen SoundScan. Uh, and Luminate provides US music consumption data on uh, various types of uh, platforms. Uh, so what we are going to use is digital single sales, uh, which Luminate reports at the recording level. And I, I have to tell you a little bit about what a recording means. So a recording is, think of it as when someone performs a piece of music in a studio, that performance is recorded and put on some digital or analog media, and it's given a, a unique code called an ISRC code. So that's a recording. From a recording, you can create multiple tracks and you can sell them on uh, the iTunes store. Right? So you can create a track on album A, a track on album B, and sell those two tracks. All tracks from the same recording are orally indistinguishable. They sound the same except for silence added to the start or the end of a track. So silence is added to create gaps between the previous track on the album. Right? So that's the, only, that's the only difference between tracks coming from the same recording. The length can differ because of added silence. So Luminate reports uh, digital single sales for every recording aggregated over all tracks and aggregated over all stores. So we're not actually, we can't see how, what sales are from the iTunes store, but because the iTunes store was the majority of sales, they had a market share of 70%. We're just going to assume that pretty much all of these sales are from, uh, from iTunes. Amazon did not, Amazon had 30 second previews throughout this, uh, the period of the sales that we analyzed. So Amazon, Amazon MP3 store was the second sort of competitor at this time. The other outcomes, which is uh, the streams for every song and on-demand and program streams for every song and the radio airplay audience impressions, those Luminate reports, those are the level of artist and title. And so that's at a higher level of aggregation than a recording. And this sort of visualization on the right over here is, uh, I'm trying to illustrate what the relationship between these two is. So for a given artist title, let's say Creep by Radiohead, you can have multiple recordings Recording one is the album, the one that's actually the main one on the album. Recording two is a live uh, version. Recordings are given different ISRC codes and they sound different. And then for each recording, you have multiple tracks and tracks don't sound uh, different. Right? So this is this is the data set that we get from Luminate. And let me uh, talk a little bit about some interesting descriptors of this data set. And I'll, Jeremy, I'll talk about uh, your question about where the preview starts. So I think that's an interesting thing to look at. Uh, so the, the sample we construct is we union the top rock songs in 2008 and 2009, and we analyze their consumption in 2010 and 2011. So these are all, so, there are no new releases in 2010 and 2011. Okay. And I'm showing you uh, what Billboard, but what the top 50 looked like just to convince you that it wasn't all Taylor Swift. Right? So it wasn't dominated by one artist uh, at the time. So over here, what I'm showing you on the right is the distribution of sales in the entire uh, study period and the plot on the bottom left, let's see if this works. Oh, okay, this works. Yeah, so this plot on the uh, uh, the bottom right is the, the, the average monthly sales for treated and controlled recordings. 
and you can see that it's not all super hit songs. There is this skew of, of sales. Uh, uh, and one thing I want to note here is that the treatment status is not based on Apple's announcement. I'm not assigning it based on whether the length of the song was 150 seconds or long. I'm actually looking at the preview audio length. And I'm using that to assign the treatment status of every uh, recording. And now let's look at the actual preview statistics. So what does the preview audio look like? So in the, to the top two plots, I'm plotting the length of the preview of treated and controlled recordings before and after the policy change. And you can see that before the policy change, the, the length was a maximum of 30 seconds. And after the policy change for treated recordings, it went up to uh, 90 seconds. But you can see that there are, it, it wasn't 30 or 90. It wasn't like a sharp dichotomy between 30 or 90. There were some songs that had preview lengths between uh, 30 and 90. The bottom two plots are, are the interesting ones. So what I'm plotting here is where is the location of the preview in each recording before and after the policy change. So the before is on the bottom left and the after is on the bottom right. And it's it's kind of interesting. 90% of previews start at 0, 30, and 45 seconds. Like the most popular start time was 45. The second most popular was 30, and the third was 0. And when, after the policy change, pretty much all the long previews started at the same time as a short preview. So for some reason, there was no sort of strategic behavior in preview location. Artists just extended the lengths of their previews by 60 seconds. And so that's kind of, that's kind of interesting, um, interesting fact that I see in this data. Right? So this was our uh, recording level data set. Uh, Jeremy, did you have a question? Oh, yes. Uh, sorry, just one quick clarification. Maybe I missed this. About the treatment. So, so what is yeah. the treated in so i thought the treatment is the adoption of this uh 90 seconds preview um so the, what's treated in pre-policy so the as a as an artist you didn't have a choice so if your song was longer than 150 seconds your preview had to be uh, uh 90 seconds long unless there was some exception i don't know i don't know how those exceptions happen but a minority of songs had but they were longer than 150 seconds but they had previews less than 90 seconds so but most of the songs you didn't have an option of adopting a longer preview or not you just had to have a longer preview so that's right. what i, I mean by I, I was i was confused about uh what is treated and control and also pre and post policy ah okay so treated a treated recording is a recording for which its preview changed, uh, the preview length changed before December 2010 and after 2000, December 2010. So that's a treated recording. A control recording is a recording whose preview length did not change before and after this policy change. And the policy change, the, the policy change happened on uh, December 2010. So that's the month of the policy change. And then what's the reason why the controls didn't change the length of preview? So that was the, that was Apple's preview policy. If your, if the song was shorter than 150 seconds, you could stay with the 30 second preview or you would, you will stay with 30 second preview. I see. I see. So, so basically there's no decision from the musicians. So either, so it's a shorter than 150 seconds, then, you know, you stay with 30. Yeah. And then if it's longer, then you go to 90 for everybody. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. So the announcement said that there is no, you don't have an option. The announcement said, if you don't like this, you just leave the platform. But then when you actually look at the preview lens, I did find a few songs that managed to be, that managed to have shorter previews. And I don't know what, how that happened, but that's just, it, it, it happened. But yes, majority of the songs didn't have a choice. Just, Just a, a quick question. Oh, sorry, go ahead. Pardon me, I didn't see who that was, but go ahead, yeah. Uh, uh, just a quick clarification question. What is the rash, what was iTunes reasoning for increasing the preview length for songs greater than the 150 seconds? Okay, so the, the stated reasoning was they believed it would increase sales because people would 
see more of the song. Uh, but the speculative reasoning from the media at the time was they were testing out moving to a streaming model. So this actually was like a load test on their servers or something like that. Next. Uh, yeah, I just, you know, I'm a, a, one last uh, comment. It seems like these control and treatments are maybe qualitatively quite different songs. So I, I'm guessing you kind of account for this later by uh, almost, I don't want to say DID, but so looking at the treatments yeah. before and after. But um, can you comment a little bit more on that? I feel like most rock songs I know of, especially the ones you said with guitar solos, are longer than a minute and a half. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah. Most songs, you're right, you're right. And so just a, a comment there. I mean, you, you said there were some songs that were long that didn't get pushed the 90. I mean, that seems like a decent robustness if there's sufficient samples there. Ah, yeah. So, okay. So I'm not, I don't have that in these slides, uh, but if you treat this as sort of this you, as a regression discontinuity and look at songs around the threshold, uh, you find results. The magnitudes are not the same as what I'm going to report, but qualitatively the results are the are in the same direction. But yes, that's, yes, that's a robustness check. I can do that for sure. Yeah. But yes, these songs are different. So I'm just, I'm really relying on the trends being parallel over time. And I'm relying on this parallel trends assumption. I th I'll talk about this. I'll, I'll talk about this uh, when we get to this. Not a question, just to clarify on the context. Yeah. Um, you show there's a distribution of how long uh, the treated uh, videos uh, musics have so is it like a uh, do all the artists take this active role in changing the length or do they default to 90 seconds if they don't um, do anything you don't uh, so similar to what Jeremy was asking you don't have a choice so if your song was longer than 150 seconds you had to move to a 90 second preview that's how does the density at say like 50 seconds or 70 seconds arise yeah so that i i don't know so what my hunch is is that a few artists were able to push back uh and get their recordings shorter than uh shorter than 90 seconds but i don't actually know how how that ended up um my only hunch is that these artists were able to push back and get a shorter preview for and it's it's also if you look at the artists uh, that had these sh uh, shorter previews it was not that all of their songs they had liberty to do this for all of their songs they managed to do it for some songs so um, yeah i'm i'm not sure how how those middle densities actually happened Matt, uh, I have I have a clarification uh, kind of question. Uh, so, did any of the short songs increase their uh, previews? Any of the short songs increased to ninety second previews? No. So none of them. Why is that? I mean, policy wise. It was not I mean, yeah, I know they 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 they, they are not uh, required to do so, um, but what's the reason? In a sense that now, if if I know that longer songs, they are, if my competitors they are showing more information about their products, right? Uh, I think from a competitive point of view, I have an, uh, an incentive to also promote more my product. So yeah, yeah. How think... come it's remained constant? Yeah, the sentiment at that time for longer previews was not positive. So it was, at least in the media at the time, people were like, why should I give away so much of my song for free? Um, there was some resistance from, not, not, from the, not from the artists, but from people who collect money on behalf of the artists. So there was actually a push in the opposite direction. A, lo a lot of people said, you are... Apple is performing my song, more of my song. Why am I not getting royalties just from the fact that their preview is longer, right? Remember, the preview length increased, but it doesn't mean they were earning from these royalties of listening to a preview. Yeah, so I think that might be a reason why nobody pushed for a longer preview when they were not given one. 
you much. Quick question, and uh, there is, I guess there is more questions on the uh, different comparisons, different controls, but I'll delete them till the till the like when you show results. But to clarify, like you said that some labels left the platform. That seems important for your treatment group. Can you talk a bit more about which percent left and like how to think about this? So my, so the I don't I don't actually see who left the platform. My songs were released in 2008 and 2009 and they had sales digital music sales to uh, 2010 and 2011 right so that that's what my sample has i don't actually see who left i don't know if labels were there any labels left but that was the that was what the policy said that if you don't want longer previews you had to leave the platform I guess what I'm, what I'm asking is that to interpret, to interpret, to compare pre-post uh, versus control, it's it's important to think about selection of like who are the companies we're looking at in the treatment. Hmm. Because if I'm, and it's very aligned with your effect, right? I think if I think it will benefit me, I'll stay. If I think it's bad for me, I'll leave. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So I can say that none of the major labels left. And at this time, the proportion of independent label was not very high. This was pre-streaming. So, right, I don't know, eight, 90, I don't know what the fraction is, but the majority of music produced by major labels was still on the platform. So the people who left would have been independent labels. And I'd have to think about how does that affect my interpretation of the estimate? Like if a few independent labels just left, they took their music away. How does that? Uh, yeah, that's a good question. I'll have to think about how that affects uh, things. I mean, Imad, maybe to add on Andres. I mean, I mean, around thinking through the con the self selection of the control, even more more so even than the treatment. I mean, these are either those who decided somehow to hope that Apple would not kick them out, or those who are very different from the treatment in the sense they're much much shorter songs. Is is that am I understanding? This correct, just trying to understand what what makes this a control that that we should be comparing to the treatment. Um, so again, they're, they're inherently different in at least at least couple of ways. Yeah, yeah. So the so, so the main reason I'm using them as a control is that their uh, excerpt length uh, did not change by by design. Uh, so they didn't actually select right whether they they should remain the same or not. So that's the main reason I'm using them as a control. But then, yes, so these short songs, so I, so they're different in, so they're not older, uh, but they are different in, in the sense that there are some artists who, first of all, they're a minority of songs. Uh, they're not, they typically don't have music videos. Uh, and you can, I guess that explains why they, in general, they have a lower, the say, the number of sales is also lower, right? So they're different in a few ways, and I'm really relying on the fact that they're different, but that the sales trends of the treatment and control are parallel, yeah, and they more, would have been the parallel. DID will be there, not just the <laughs> yeah, and and some parallel trends. Uh... Yeah, yeah. So I don't. Yeah, uh, we can talk about this offline. So there there's some ways uh, in which uh, they're different, and some ways in which they're similar. So we can we can talk about this later. All right, so this was the first uh, data set, which was at the recording level. Uh, I also have the supplementary data set at the artist title level. Right? So this is for the non-iTunes consumption. And I'll just, so I'll, I'll, skip, I'll skip this slide and talk about the results uh, when I get to them later. Right. So now, uh, so given, this, given this data set, let me show you what was my, the main effect of longer excerpts, right? And I'm going to just, Estimate this effect with a standard two-way fixed effects. Treatment was not staggered. I don't have to worry about uh, staggered treatment issues. The only thing I'm going to add as the control is the age of the recording as the, num uh, as the number of years since it's released. So I'm going to have some specifications with that as a control. Otherwise, I don't have any controls. And my main assumption is parallel tracks. So I'm going to assume that if there was no policy change, these two groups of songs 
would have the same sales in every month on average. So let me first show you the. the you must be too elaborate yeah. on that. Uh, the, like, why isn't that absorbed by the fixed effect? Which why isn't what uh, absorbed? Like the age, the age of the the age of the release. Oh, so the age, uh, the age is time varying. So when I observe sales in. Uh, um, in 2011, for a song, the age is going to be one more than when I observe sales in 2010. Right? So it's the age at the time that I observe the sales. Mm. And that's going to be quite correlated with the outcome because it, sales is depreciated mm. over time. Right? Mm -hmm. That's yeah, that's the concern. And let me just show you the main results from the specification. So what I find is that the longer previews increased sales by between four and 5%. If you include the controls, uh, it's 5.4%. At uh, the age controls, it's 5.4%. If you don't include them, it's 4%. So that's sort of the main effect I find. And let me now talk about this parallel trends example. Uh, so the first thing I'm going to show is the event study plots. I'm going to show you some support that have a parallel free trends and then say that okay the, it would have been it would have been true even in the post period right? so what i'm showing here is the event study coefficients for uh when i'm including not including age the age fixed effects and if i include the age fixed effects and you can see that before the policy change these coefficients are all sort of close to zero and after the policy change they are uh, it's, it's significantly different from zero the main threat that I'm worried about in this setting is promotional events. So if there's a concert or if there's a release of an album or something like that, the songs that are performed or promoted in the concert, they're not going to be equally short and long songs. Right? Like most likely they're going to be more long songs than short songs. And this is going to bias my effect upward because more short, long songs are promoted because of the concerts than short songs. So that's the main thing I'm concerned about. And to deal with that concern, what I'm going to do is I'm going to look at the an outcome that is not on iTunes. I'm going to look at outcomes on streaming platforms and on the radio. And I'm going to argue that if there was some sort of promotion or concert happening or something like that, it should also show up outside of iTunes. Right? And that's where I'm using this artist title level data set. So I'm going to start by just showing you in this artist title level data set, what is the effect on digital single sales? So here I'm sort of aggregating uh, digital single sales up to the artist title level uh, by picking one recording for every artist title. Right? So there's, there is a, a marginally significant effect on sales. But if you look at the other outcomes which Luminate gives me for radio airplay, program streams, and on-demand streams, there is no uh, significant effect. And I'm going to use this to argue that if there was some sort of promotional event coincident with the policy change, it should have showed up on at least one of these outcomes, but it didn't actually show up. So this is sort of, yeah, this, this is my uh, main identification uh, argument. A mad quick question here. Should I, I mean, if there were increased purchases on iTunes, should I expect some of, say, like on-demand streams to be decrease from just some, from some, from some substitution. I guess, uh, so on, de so what are the on demand? The, I mean, it, so the on demand streams platforms at the time were YouTube, um, and Rhapsody and things like that. They were not big, except for YouTube, they were not very big platforms and they mostly hosted I guess popular, I, I don't think there's a one-to-one -one match between the content on those platforms and uh, the content on, iTunes had a bigger library, but YouTube, YouTube definitely had a huge uh, user base. Um, so I think, yeah, there should be some, some substitution, but I'm not sure how big that substitution is going to be. I think it'll depend on the overlap of the song libraries. Can I can I ask a quick 
Oh, sorry. Well, you were just still saying I didn't mean to cut you off. No, no, no. Go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah, yeah. Go ahead. Um, just quickly, do you have access to ranking of songs on iTunes? Because one of the things you might be worried about that this promotions might be platform specific. I do. I don't have rankings, but I have access to some sales data. So iTunes had like this weekly free single. And yeah, I, so I do have some access to that data. Yes. But it's a bit different, right? So like a sale is an outcome you care about. A ranking by the platform, like maybe I have this policy and as a platform, I want to promote it. I want to benefit songs who decide to do this longer, like longer excerpts. Yeah. yeah, I can get that. I think I know how to get that. And then I can add a, a add another covariate for when a song is kind of showing up in the top 10 on the homepage or something like that. Yeah. Or just show us that there is no movement on that side, like on the supply of this. And then another thing, maybe I'll, you'll get to this. I wonder if, if you show us um, kind of only songs which are close and away from this 150 minutes threshold, and you show us robustness of the results only for, for this songs, you'll have the same, all the same concerns. I wonder if you're getting to that at some point, but it seems like this will be convinced to address one of the comments which you're getting now. Yeah, so I don't have that in the slides, but uh, that test does, it it holds up. Uh, so I do find, so the reason I don't have it in the slides is it kind of restricts me to these songs that are um, between like close to 150 seconds long, which is a smaller population. But yeah, that's that's a good robustness check that actually holds up. So maybe I'll include it in the next version of this, uh, of this talk. Imad, on, on, on the results you find here, I mean, it's kind of, on the one hand, it's, it's, it helps. It helps with excluding your, uh, the concerns. But could one look at it as finding that there is no spillover effect? Meaning, uh, if this 90 second works, right, one would hope it would also lead to some people hearing about it and, and doing more also off platform or, or streaming or, right? I mean, I mean it's, it should uh, have a positive effect. I mean, it may be just a finding that there isn't a spillover yeah. effect, but just thinking about it as more, uh, not just as control, but also as, as a finding of, of no spillover effect, which interpreting null effects is always tough. But uh... yeah, yeah, maybe. Okay, so maybe I, I, I'll just show you my uh, some of my heterogeneity results. If you If you split these songs by popularity, and you look at the popular songs, the songs that had more than the median sales, there was a negligible effect on those songs. And those songs are the ones more likely to be I on see. YouTube. So maybe this explains the null effect, or partly explains it. And so I think that's a good, yeah, I think that's a good uh, thing to study. And did you look at that originating entrainment effect for the other platforms? Would be interesting to see maybe if you find that the, yeah. that, that, that actually the less popular songs actually do get some spillover. Um, yeah. Let me, yeah, I, I haven't looked at that. So let me look at that. Thank you. Just, there was one question in Q&A and maybe I can also one way to push it forward a bit because you have 10 minutes left, just as a heads up. The question is yeah. about uh, complexity of sons and uh, how it correlates with how long a preview is sufficient. Uh, is there any way to score some complexity repetition and then look at heterogeneous impacts? Yeah, that's, that's exactly what I'm going to talk about next. So the next part is about measuring some properties of the audio that are related to information in the audio. Uh, and repetition is one thing which you'd expect reduces information intuitively. Uh, so yeah, that's what I'm looking at next. Uh, but because I have 10 minutes, let me, I'm going to try compressing this section and give you sort of the highlights. Okay? So I'm going to measure, uh, the, the intuition is exactly as the audience member said. There are 90 second previews. Not all of them are equally informative. Some of them are super repetitive uh, and so on. So we're going to come up with two measures of audio-based information reduction, right? repetition and predictability. And we're going to see moderation with this. So that's exactly what I'm going to do. So let me tell you about my uh, repetition measure. And I'm not going to motivate it. I think uh, it's, it's motivated enough. So then this is your, if you want to take away one thing from this talk, it's this. Uh, so how do we measure repetition if without actually reducing the audio into uh, sort of uh, its lyrics or some other low fidelity rep uh, representation? So we're using this uh, pro the properties of digital compression algorithms. So how do these algorithms work? 
if I take a 10 byte audio file and I give it to a compression algorithm, these are called codecs for audio and video. What these algorithms do is they find repetition and use it to compress the audio. Right? So if I take this 10 bytes of audio and give it to this algorithm called run length encoding, which is a very simple compression algorithm, it gets encoded with an encoded length of four bytes. So you can think of this as 10 bytes of audio have four bytes of information. And on, in contrast, if I take a 10 byte audio that is not very repetitive, and I give it to the same algorithm, run length encoding, it's going to end up as 10 bytes. And there are more sophisticated algorithms that do this, like MP3, FLAC, and AAC. But the high level idea is when audio has higher repetition, it's going to have a lower encoded length. And the only cav and so you can use encoded length as a proxy for repetition. And that's, that's what you're going to do. The only caveat here is that the output quality has to be fixed. So you can't use an encoding algorithm that varies the output, uh, the perceptual audio quality of the output. And there is a class of encoding algorithms that do this, which, which is called CDR, and we, we can't use them. So this is what we do. We take the 30 second and 90 second previews. We throw out all the previews that are in between, and then we measure their repetition by measuring their encoded length. And you can see that there is variation in the encoded length even though the, the audio length is fixed. So it's all 90 seconds or 30 seconds. So we bin the encoded lengths and use them as indicators in my two-way fixed effects specification. So this is how we measure repetition and we, we are able to construct sort of this dose response curve. It's not actually dose response because I'm not, it's not a treatment, but it, you can see the heterogeneity. And just to summarize what we find, uh, the main finding is that less repetitive previews are more demand enhancing. And this is consistent with repetition reducing information um, and uh, uh, excerpts providing information to consumers. Uh, one thing I was concerned about was maybe people just don't like repetitive rock music. Maybe that's why repetition is causing a reduction in uh, the impact of longer excerpts. But when I went back and checked the correlation between the repetition in the full song and pre-policy sales, I find a very weak correlation. So I don't think it's because of people disliking uh, repetitive rock. And in fact, if you look at prior literature, a lot of it actually finds that repetition is uh, desirable. So I have a slide on that. There's, there's, some, there's a nice paper in JCP which says that repetition, people like uh, repetition. Um, so this was the, the main result on the repetition side. I have uh, another measure which is related to repetition. I'm not going to be able to talk about it in, in too much detail, but it's in the slides and it's in the paper. And that is predictability. So maybe a song is not repetitive, but you're able to predict it because you listen to a lot of music and you sort of know the common patterns of, of, of musical notes that people use. Um, and that's sort of these sort of patterns of musical notes are what separates uh, like an amateur piano player like me versus someone like Hortense uh, who, who can play actual music. Right? So we're going to use, the intuition is that a predictable musical note has less marginal information because you know it's you know what's going to happen and it happens. Right? And then the operation challenge is how do we measure predictability? And the way we do that is by using um, so I'm going to skip this slide. The way we measure predictability is using generative models of music. So what we do is you can think of this as approximating a music listener with a generative music model. You give this music uh, and the way these models work is it's kind of interesting. They're very similar to language models. They take the audio, they convert them to a bunch of tokens, and then they pass them through a bunch of conditional probabilities. And then they use these to sample the next token. Right? So very similar to language models. And what this means is you can just use uh, a generative music model to measure the predictability of, or the unpredictability of an excerpt right? With, and without doing any kind of complicated processing. You don't have to convert the audio to like a score or MIDI or anything. That's it. And what we find, uh, and, and excerpt, the, uh, the perplexity has this property that the lower the perplexity, the more predictable and what we find when we, we, we do this, a similar sort of empirical strategy to repetition, and what we find is that, so we find one, one unsurprising finding and one surprising finding. 
The first is that predictable previews are less demand enhancing. So these are all 90 second previews. Predictable previews are less demand enhancing, and this is consistent with predictability reducing information. We also find that unpredictable previews are less demand enhancing, and this was surprising. So I went and looked at what do these sound like? What does unpredictability sound like? And this is mostly guitar and drum solos. Uh, and possible explanations for why this is happening is maybe it's hard to extrapolate from these un from unpredictable music to the full song. So maybe it's information reducing in a sense. But an alternative explain an alternative explanation is maybe people have a preference for moderate levels of uh, musical surprise. Right? So this is something people have found in neuroscience. So Pierce has a nice paper about this. Uh, so there are two, two possible explanations here that uh, we can't actually disentangle at this point uh, with this data. So let me, uh, so this was the unpredictability result. Um, and I'm just going to, I'm just going to put the slide of the summary of findings here and just stop uh, for questions. All right, maybe I actually a natural step. So thanks, thanks, Imad, for also managing kind of last uh, last part of the talk very quickly. Uh, maybe it's a good time. I'll just we'll just end the official time of the talk, and we invite people to stick around for more questions and a discussion.